one more race to go here at Doncaster this afternoon, and when that race is over, it'll be the last racing result read by the man we know as JT. John Tyrrell, you're retiring in a few minutes' time. It'll be very sad to see you go, but when did it all start? How many years ago? 17 years, actually. 17. It all started at Southern Television yeah. with Fred Dynage, who had a curious idea uh, to do a program in Southport, yeah. and, the, and I had to play a character called the Mystery Tipster. And they blackened you out, didn't That's they? right. Yes. I appeared in silhouette, and the idea was that the punters had to guess who I was, yeah. which wouldn't be difficult, really, I suppose. With, after, the, voice, the, with the voice yes. like that. <laughs> but yeah. on the other hand, uh, I also had to tip some winners, and we were a bit lucky. Uh, I managed to give some very good winners for uh, big handicaps, mm. and in particular, in particular, the Schwetz Gold Trophy um, in 1977, which was won by True Lad at 14 to 1. 14 to and that's one. what really set me off. And then you graduated to network TV, and uh, it was World of Sport. Do you remember the good old days, the IGB oh, 7 yes. and Dickie Davis sitting there with his. And, and you sat, where did you sit? Well, I sat in a box uh, a little way away from Dickie, um, yeah. compiling the results with Joe James, who still works with me now after Joe all this James, time. Joe James, yeah, he's with us. And, uh, yeah. He's still with us. And, uh, I, we, we were sort of tucked away in a corner, um, and then I was a voice man on the program, essentially, that was the thing. You were a voice man with Bob Colston. That's and, right. And you had a nickname, you two. What was that? Well, we were called the Colonel and the Major, and yeah. it all started because Bob and I had a habit of popping up to the bar at 12 o'clock before the program started. And some of the younger members of the production team thought we were a couple of old codgers standing in the corner, like yeah. somebody at St. James's Club, you know, the East India or somewhere. Yeah. And consequently, they dubbed us the Colonel and the Major. Yeah. Uh, and the name stuck, and that's how it happened. Well, you weren't a, you weren't a Major, though, were you? No, I wasn't. That's was the whole joke. I was a corporal in the Pay Corps, and Bob Colston was an A.C. Flonk in the RAF. <laughs> <laughs> we were never commissioned officers at all. I <laughs> love it. Well, Bob Colston, as you know, is still reading the football results on ITV. Four far two, Queen's Park nil. And finally, Ross County six, Albion one. Hello, Major. I hear you retiring from the voiceover business after all those years of reading the racing results on ITV and now on Channel 4. Well, well done, sir. Great, great thing to do. I'm sure the people in the racing world will really miss your voice. But I remember you, of course, working on the old World of Sports programs for all those years, where we had a, a wonderful time together as the two unseen voices for sport. Well, I'll raise my glass, Major, and say good luck to you, John. I know you're going to do some writing work now. All the best. Long and happy retirement to you. Lovely to yeah. see Bob in vision. Was it uh, water or a touch of gin in that part? I wouldn't like to guess. <laughs> I wouldn't like to guess. <laughs> you, you started in the theatre, didn't you, a long time ago? Yes, I did. That's quite right. Uh, I started in the theatre. I went to the Weber Douglas School of Speech and Drama way back mm. in the 1950s. Mm. And for ten years or more, I was a professional actor. And that really is how I got into television anyway. And it's interesting you say that because John McCrick, never one to miss an opportunity, made reference to your theatrical background a, a couple of years ago on Channel 4. Now, JT, that's a word with you, your velvet tongue giving the results to the thousands of results you've read. But in the 3.35 at Ascot, the Cornwallis Stakes, Lord Olivier ran. Now, I know you were a close friend of the great man, and I was horrified when Lord Olivier ran a new market last week. One horrible bookmaker called 13 to 2, Lord Oliver. Absolutely disgraceful. I certainly rem remonstrated with him. But one uncouth lout doesn't make up all the bookmakers we know. But you as a fellow theft did, and of course, I'm sure, JT, you called him Larry. How do you reckon Lord Olivier would perform as your understudy? Well, I can only say that the result from Banger, the 325, was won by number two, the Demon Barber, at 4 to 1. Second number five, He Who Dares Wins, 100 to 30. Uh, number six, Pro Plus, the 11 to 4 favourite, was third, and seven ran. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, JT. You bring all the drama to it. But I hear as well as your second understudy, you've got Sir John Gielgud with you. Oh, dear boy. Uh, the 340. One by number one, Jocks Byrne, 9 to 4, joint favourite. Second number two, Kaylee Boyd, 9 to 2. And the third horse, Rod Hithal, at 11 to 4. Number five, Knowing, was the other joint favourite. And five, Raneth. <laughs> <laughs> I ran it. You actually worked with Olivier, did you say? I worked with Olivier. I yeah. carried a spare in Coriolanus, I think, at Stratford uh, in about 1959. <laughs> you carried uh, a spare. Well, I, I, I can claim to have acted with him. Yes, that is but only something. Just. <laughs> You've got many, many memories. And when you get back to your little house in Newmarket tonight, 
and you're sitting with your feet up in front of the fire with one of your dreadful martini cocktails, which make some Channel 4 presenters fall out of bed when they get home. What, what is your greatest memory? What would what, you we'll back on? Well, I think it would have to be the 1979 derby. It was the first derby I ever covered on television. Mm. Uh, it was the 200th derby, so it was a big occasion. Yeah. There were lots of runners. The Queen had a runner. Pickett rode for her, I think a horse called Milford. Steve Corton's first derby. Uh, and, of course, it was won by Troy in the most exciting race that I think probably I've ever seen. And, uh, just take me back. Well, that was pre-computer days, wasn't it? The results in those days. You were telling me you had to write them out with a pen or something. Well, I didn't write them out. Yeah. I, my cocky Moore, my uh, predecessor, he used to do it, but I had a graphic artist because nobody could read my writing. Yeah. But a chap sat next to me, uh, literally scrawling out the, the names, you yeah. know, and put them on a card. Uh, and then that would be popped into a box in front of a camera, I would read it, and if there were more results to come, the scene hand would whip out the cards in succession, <laughs> and I would read them, and that was yeah. how it was done. And <laughs> nowadays it's just all... all da -da -da -da. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not quite the same. <laughs> well, that was the result of the derby, but the race itself, it was something very special. I remember Troy coming from an awful long way back, and Ken Butler, I remember he was rather keen on it, wasn't he? Yes, well, Ken was a paddock commentator then, yeah. uh, and in those days, of course, the tape returns uh, were declared to a ten pence stake, mm. uh, and I think uh, Northern Baby, the third horse, paid 172. Mm. And uh, Northern Baby had some very good form yeah. in France, uh, but hadn't been seen in England before. And Ken spotted this horse in the paddock, thought it was a good chance, started at 66 to 1. Yeah. And he scrambled down from his perch and ran across the toe during the race and had a massive, not during the race, before the race, yeah. and had a, a, a really good touch on the toe. That, uh, well, as I say, 172, it paid the 10 pence. It was something very special. It was the 200th derby. Troy and Willie Carson in the lead, going away from Dickens Hill, Northern Baby. Ella Man and Moon, life is with, as they come out towards the line. It's Willie Carson who wins the derby on Troy. Dickens Hill is second, then comes Northern Baby. Ah, oh, lovely to see that again. That was 1979. I remember Willie Carson this year did something similar with uh, with Erhard, but he came on the inside, didn't he? So. Mm, yes, he did, but it was a similar kind of run. Uh, he obviously hasn't lost the habit in, what, 15 years? He yeah. hasn't. Well, you haven't lost the habit in, what, 17 years you've been reading the racing results for us. What are you going to do in the future, John? Well, I shall uh, <coughs> do mostly writing, I hope. Um, I've got my history of the jockey club to complete. I've got yeah. a couple of other book projects for next year. I've obviously contributed to magazines of one sort and another. I have done for, for some time. Mm. Uh, I mean, you say I'm retiring, but I don't think I'm really retiring. It's a bit like the old soldiers never die. You know, they just end up reading racing results. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, I hope you and Ginny enjoy yourselves in the future. And uh, by the way, we thought we would club together, and I thought we'd give you something rather nice. At least you'd be able to watch the start and the end of the program. This is rather nice. And this is it. It's a lovely watch. JT, on behalf of the Channel 4 team, can I wish you very happy retirement in the future. And thank you from all the Channel 4 viewers for reading us out. Lots of winners and unfortunately lots of losers as well. Good luck, John. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank, thank you, you very, very much indeed. And I'd like to say thank you to all the team and all my colleagues in television, of course, and all my friends in racing too. And especially the boys from the Grosvenor Arms at Newmarket. And I hope they've got a large one waiting for me on the bar tomorrow. I hope they will. Thank you, JT. <laughs> well, we all wish John all the very, very best. And I'm sure we'll continue to see him around the race courses. Now.